Okay, in this video, I'm going to continue on with exercise 3C of the book Fundamental Applied Mathematics. We're on page number 80, and the question is number 2. It reads, the particles projected down an inclined plane with speed u. If the line of projection makes an angle alpha with the plane, while the plane makes an angle beta with the horizontal, show that the maximum range is given by, and we're given an expression in the book. Now, I'll be honest, this question, uh, I tried to do it, we'll say, in an initial video, and I found that the manipulation or the algebra was uh, painful basically. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to go through the the uh, resolving the vectors quickly. All right, uh, We've done this in the past. If it's gone too quickly just put a comment in the video. But what I want to really do is concentrate on the, the actual the algebra itself and the trigonometry shall we say. So first thing I'm going to do is like I said I'm going to go through this quickly and I'm going to assume that you've seen all this before. If you haven't you should have. It's in my other videos and put a comment in my video either way. Okay so the first thing we do is we draw our x and y axis, making our x y plane. The next thing we do is we draw our incline. And we make a new axis, x prime and y prime. We say the x prime axis is our incline, and we draw our y prime perpendicular to that. Doesn't matter, of course, that could be drawn anywhere, just there for simplicity. We know that this angle here is beta. The next thing is we're told that the projectile is projected at an angle alpha to the uh, to the incline itself. So this is u and this is alpha here like that. And we know that by the way I'm going to define my unit vectors like so. This is i hat and this is j hat. That means this is u sub x prime i hat plus u sub y prime j hat. And we need to resolve the vector alpha into its component unit vectors. They're the two vectors which when added together make the angle alpha and they must be parallel to the uh, to the planes or to the axes x prime y prime, so this vector here is parallel to the x prime. This vector here is parallel to the y prime. So this is u sub y, and this vector here is u sub x. So the next thing we need to do is just resolve those. So u sub x becomes u times the cosine of alpha, and u sub y is u times the sine of alpha as normal. So the next thing I'm going to do is just make note of that down here. Just bear with me now. So this is u cos alpha. This is u sine of alpha. Noting of course that their directions, this is in actual fact i hat. This one here is j hat. So that was reasonably straightforward. That's something, nothing we haven't done in the past. And I know I'm going quickly here, but I told you why. So we can rub out all of these things, because the next, the next thing I want to resolve is gravity. Gravity being the trickier of all the, of the two. So gravity, as we know, acts in the negative, y, uh, the negative y dimension. So it acts in this direction here. And how we resolve this is by drawing, first of all, a line parallel with the y prime. So here's y prime, so let's draw, there's that line. And when we can, we draw a line parallel with the x prime. That's a 90 degree angle. This is g, and they must be in those directions. So this is g sub y, this is g sub x. So g sub x, and we have g sub y. We also know, of course, that when two angles, if that's beta, I will say, and that's bisected by another angle, uh, at another uh, angle at right angles to it. We'll say this is alpha, then alpha equals beta, which is what we have here if we extend down g sub y. So for that reason, this angle here, beta, is up here too. And therefore g sub x becomes g sine of beta, and g sub y becomes g cos beta because cos is for adjacent and sine is for opposite. So we're going to note these down here. Oh actually before we do that we need of course to remember that we define uh, why did I do that? We define gravity at minus 9.81. Now if you look at this here we'll see that g sub x is in the positive x prime dimension so it's actually going to accelerate the particle in that direction. So for that reason this expression here must be positive. G cos beta is in the negative y prime direction, so that must be negative. 
So when we plug in nine, minus 9.81, this will be negative, which is fine. However, currently this will be positive. So we need to put another negative sign there. Negative times negative gives a positive. So this is an actual fact, minus g sine of beta. This is g times the cos of beta. And remember, like I said in the book, or said, sorry, in the past, the book will do that in the opposite way. It will say that it the, that it's minus g is equal to 9.8, and it'll have minus, this will be positive and this will be negative. They are in actual fact the same thing. So, get rid of all of this. Ras defines the range. Now, what is the range? That is when the s sub y is equal to 0. So, we need to find, first of all, s sub y, and then find out the time at which s sub y is equal to 0. So it's ut plus a half at squared. So it becomes u sine alpha t, and it's plus a half g cos beta t squared. We want that equal to zero. So we're going to say s sub y is equal to u sine alpha t plus a half g cos beta t squared is equal to zero. We're going to take out t. We're going to get u sine of alpha plus g over 2 cos beta t is equal to zero. If two things are multiplied together to get zero, one of them must be zero. So in this case it's t. And secondly, if we rearrange this, we're going to get minus u sine of alpha times 2, in fact, over g cos beta is equal to t. And we should know, of course, that time is always positive. This currently looks negative, but look, this, this g is a minus number, giving us a positive again. So is that correct? Yes, it is. And so I'm just going to note this down here. So the next thing we're asked to do is find the range. Now, of course, we've, we found the time at which it's at its maximum range. So we need to actually find the maximum range now. So we're going to plug the time into the expression for s sub x. So the expression for s sub x is ut plus a half at squared. So it's u cos alpha t minus g over 2 sine of beta t squared. Now I'm going to be honest, this is going to take a while, so I'm going to rearrange this on the paper in front of you. So I'm going to write it again up here, so we get u cos of alpha times t minus g over 2 sine of beta t squared, where we know that t is equal to minus 2u sine of alpha over g cos beta. Alright, so just let me clear up the, the whiteboard here. And continue. So the first thing we're going to do, of course, is plug in the value for t. So we're going to get u times the cos of alpha times minus 2u sine of alpha over g cos beta minus g over 2 sine of beta times this squared. So this is going to be uh, 4u squared sine squared alpha over g cos squared beta. Now, this is where we start to get tricky. Like, it's, it's really just a bit of luck, because, like, you could do loads of things. You could, first of all, you could divide sine by cos and get, or you couldn't do that, actually, you couldn't. Sorry, you could go 2 times sine alpha cos alpha being sine 2 alpha. But to be honest, I tried that, it wouldn't get me anywhere. So the trick here is actually to, to make this into a cos squared, so we can divide g cos squared on both sides. Alright, so what that means, if, to, if we divide by cos squared, it costs to make this cos squared, we must multiply on top by cos as well. So let's do that now. So we're going to get u cos alpha, that's actually a minus of course, times 2, that's a square because the 2u squared, sine alpha over g cos squared beta. And the reason it's cos squared is because I'm after multiplying on top by cos of beta. Alright, and that's minus g over 2 uh, sine beta, g over g over 2, actually it's not, this 2 cancels that 4, so it's 2 g u squared sine beta 
sine squared alpha over g cos squared beta. So the next thing is we, we basically add the two uh, expressions there by uh, taking a common denominator, which in this case is g cos squared beta, like so. And we're going to get minus 2 u squared cos alpha sine alpha minus 2, uh, this was a g squared, excuse me, this was a g squared, and therefore this g here dies. All right? So 2 u squared sine beta sine squared alpha. So where do we go from here? Well, we go from here by doing the following. We pull out, we pull out 2 u, u squared sine alpha. over g cos squared beta. Alright, what does that leave? 2u u squared sine alpha, so that leaves a cos alpha here. 2u squared sine alpha leaves a, a, leaves a uh, wait, it doesn't leave cos alpha, it leaves a cos alpha. Uh, look, I'm after making another mistake up here. After missing a sine beta, a cos beta up here, so just let me let me fix this here now. Minus two u squared cos beta, like so. So you get cos alpha, cos beta. Now here, if we take out sine alpha, we get a sine beta sine alpha. Why is this plus? Because I pulled out the minus here, so it's minus and a minus there. So I keep the minus out here and I can turn this into a plus. Alright, now, I know that looks a bit mad. Uh, I'm sorry about it, the fact that I missed out that cos beta there, but that you should be able to follow that pretty straightforward. The next thing we need to do is make a substitution. And uh, the substitution is cos alpha cos beta plus sine beta, or sine alpha sine beta. So uh, that becomes the following. So if we bring it, we need to bring in the, the we need to bring in the two. So we're going to get the following. We're going to get minus u squared over g cos squared beta. All right, and then we're going to multiply that by two sine alpha times cos of alpha minus beta. Now why did I do that? Why did I do that? If you look here, right. Uh, this here, cos alpha cos beta plus sine alpha sine, uh, sine alpha sine beta. If you look up in your log tables, you'll find that's equal to cos alpha minus beta. So this sine alpha is here, and this becomes cos alpha minus beta, and I pull the two in here like that. Now, the next thing we need to know is as follows, that two sine a cos a is equal to sine of a plus b excuse me, plus sine of a minus b. That's once again in your log tables, so it's just a matter of looking at it. I'm just going to get rid of that because I'm low on space. And when you apply that to this, you get the following. You'll get minus u squared over g cos squared beta times sine. Now this is where you've got to be a bit, you've got to be a bit clever. And use your algebra and use your brackets correctly. Now look, the reason I have to use my brackets correctly because we're 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 taking alpha minus beta from alpha. Alright, so that's alpha minus alpha plus beta. So if you don't do your brackets correctly, you might make a mistake there. So the alphas here can cancel, and uh, the alphas here will cancel as well. Oh, sorry, the alphas here will add, excuse me. So what we're going to get finally is... Now, 2 alpha minus beta plus sine of beta. 
Alright? Doesn't that look a bit mad? Now we're getting very close to the end of this. Very close. Like I said, I need to look at my notes for this because this is so long. Alright? Now, uh, like I said, it's just manipulation and, and putting in bits and pieces that we know are in the log tables. So I'm going to clear out what we don't need anymore and start again. So what we found out there was that minus u squared over g cos squared beta times the sine of 2 alpha minus beta plus the sine of beta is equal to s sub x. Alright? So where do we go from here? Well, what we do is we uh, we need to find out if when it's a maximum, all right? When it is a maximum. Now this is tricky. I don't really know how to explain this. Two half. Let me think now. When is it a maximum? When is sine a maximum? Okay. The first thing you need to do is look at your unit circle in a wire that you can see. So this is my unit circle. We know that if we're talking about sine, sine is 0 here and 1 there, minus or 0 here and minus 1 there. So the maximum possible value you can get for sine is when, the, when it's equal to 1. So if you want this to be a maximum, this is the expression for the range. So if you want this to be a maximum, we want this expression here to be a maximum. Now, of course, if you said that sine beta is equal to 1, well, you're going to get this, as a, this, this might necessarily be a make it largest. So what we'll do is we'll say that sine 2 alpha minus beta is equal to 1. If you do that, this is the largest value that sine can be. And uh, this, yeah, this is the largest value that sine can be. And therefore this will give you your maximum range. So therefore, uh, 90 degrees, which is the sine of uh, the inverse sine of 1, is equal to 2 alpha minus beta. Therefore 90 plus beta over 2 is equal to alpha. <laughs> now I must say that, that was, that's probably the most challenging question we've done at all in the book in the 80 pages that we've done so far. And the reason it was challenging is because the, the manipulation of the algebra and the trigonometry is qu quite tricky. If you found that very difficult then I wouldn't worry about it because I'd be, like, I'd be absolutely shocked if a question like that came up in the exam. It's just, some people can see how to do these and some people don't. It's, it's more of a, a question of, um, I suppose, understanding it. Now, as to why this is a maximum, like I said, sine is maximum when, uh, sine is maximum when it's equal to 1. Alright? So, in order to maximize this expression, we want sine 2 alpha minus beta to be equal to 1. Alright? And that will maximize this whole expression. Anyway, that was that. That was quite long, all 17 minutes of it. Thank you for watching. Please pass it on to your friends and subscribe to my channel.